Hey everybody, Russ Barkley here with the Moose. Yes, he's back, he's been promoted, got a raise, taking me out for a beer. He's living quite the life, so. Right, Moosey? Yeah. All right. He doesn't look too happy up here, so let's put the Moose down and get back to our research review for the week ending September the 22nd. In this review, um, I found only three articles I thought that were worth commenting on. The rest of them you can find over in the thumbnail sketch, uh, but nothing there that I found to be earth-shattering or of much significance, certainly nothing worth commenting on. So, But have a look over there if you're interested in what was published this week. As always, I also give you the uh, web address or hot link to the articles that I do review. Uh, so this week, I want to talk, first of all, about a large analysis called a qualitative review of all of the evidence from around the world on the prevalence of ADHD in adults. This was published recently in Psychiatry Research, uh, and it's a very good review, although uh, it simply focuses on point prevalence, meaning what was the actual prevalence of the disorder at the time that these studies were done. But it included a review of uh, systematic reviews, a review of meta-analyses, this incorporated over 57 different primary studies, and the population included in these studies was over 21 million adult participants, so uh, a very high figure. Uh, there was uh, a finding here of a prevalence of 3.1% for adult ADHD worldwide. Uh, it vary somewhat, a little bit higher in some countries, a little bit lower in others, uh, but these prevalence figures are not based on referral patterns. They're based on large population surveys where a random sample is brought in and evaluated using the appropriate diagnostic criteria for whether or not they have ADHD. Some studies use mainly rating scales, others use interviews, so they vary somewhat based on their methodology. Uh, but overall, about a 3.1% prevalence, which falls in the ballpark of earlier published reviews that suggested that somewhere between 3 and 5% of adults have ADHD. Now, we have to be careful with this figure because research does show that the prevalence of ADHD declines with age, being about 7 to 8% in children. My own studies placed it at about 5.7% in the US, but let's just say it's about 7 to 8% of kids. That falls down to about 5 to 7% of adolescents and that as we get into young adults, the figure is around four to five percent. Uh, and then as we move into late life, the figure can often drop down to two to three percent. So why is that happening? Well, one obvious reason is that there is a situation where people are outgrowing their ADHD, maybe as many as 15 to 35 percent, perhaps. And that would lead to this kind of step down or decline in prevalence. So that's one possibility. There is development going on here, and the symptoms are declining with development. Uh, a second possibility has to do with who is being assessed. In the case of children and teens, the parents are serving as the source of the information, not the children or teens. Because if you were to ask the children or teens, the prevalence would be very low, and that would continue on into adulthood. For instance, in my follow-up study, when we interviewed the individuals with ADHD who grew up with it, we found that only uh, about 5% of the kids who originally had ADHD continued to report enough symptoms to have it. But when we interviewed their parents, the figure was around 66% to 85%, depending upon the criteria that we use. So the source of the information matters here. Uh, it could be that some of the decline in prevalence we're seeing in adulthood is that the studies are now shifting to interviewing the adults as the source of the information. A third reason is that it's possible that there is selective removal of people with ADHD from the population through early death. My other lectures here on health outcomes and life expectancy 
have shown that ADHD individuals have a high risk of accidental injury and death in childhood and particularly in adulthood uh, and a shorter life expectancy if their disorder is not treated. Uh, and so some of the decline in prevalence of adult ADHD, particularly toward late life, could in part be the selective removal or differential mortality rate that's influencing prevalence and not a real developmental decline in prevalence. So just some comments there on this study. Overall, uh, a significant and sizable review, placing the prevalence of adult ADHD at about 3%. Next, we're going to move over and take a look at not a research study, but an effort to develop criteria that universities and governments can use in order to document ADHD in adults, particularly young adults at university, in order to decide if they deserve accommodations in these academic environments. Uh, this particular paper was published in the Brazilian Journal of Psychiatry, and although it was done by these Brazilian authors, they went out of their way to interview experts in adult ADHD in various countries, including those who are experts in advising universities on the kinds of documentation and accommodations that uh, these individuals should uh, require or should receive. So uh, it's a very good review. I'm not going to go through all of the details. Uh, they go through a variety of things that they believe are necessary to document adult ADHD in these individuals, and that documentation is provided to the university. And then they talk about some of the accommodations that might be necessary. But mainly this is focused on what kind of criteria need to be met in order to provide accommodations. Uh, I don't have any criticisms of this article. I think it's a very thorough review, but I, there is one exception uh, that I felt was overemphasized. Uh, there's a paragraph here that states that uh, not only do the individuals need to be interviewed and people who know the student well also need to be interviewed and DSM criteria have to be met in these interviews, but they go on to argue that neuropsychological testing should be part of the documentation. Some of those tests involve IQ and achievement tests. I would agree with that. I don't really think of those as neuropsychological in nature. But others have to do with testing executive functions. And as you know from another lecture on my YouTube channel, this kind of neuropsychological testing has been found repeatedly not to be sufficiently accurate to be used in diagnosis, which is why I recommend against relying on testing in order to confirm or deny the existence of adult ADHD. Uh, and these authors apparently were not as aware of the abundant literature showing the inaccuracy of neuropsychological testing. So that's the only flaw, I think, in this position statement about documentation for accommodations in universities. Uh, otherwise, I think it's a pretty good job, and I suggest that those of you who work in universities uh, or university students might want to have a look at this to see what they are recommending. So uh, let's then move on to our last study that we're gonna talk about. This is a large study of a preschool behavior management training program for parents of ADHD children. It involved a randomized trial. It was a multi-center trial, which is very good. Uh, and this study took place in China. So uh, it is the first study I'm aware of, uh, of behavior management training for parents of preschool children in China. Uh, and it was, uh, I thought, very well done. Uh, they had 62 parents of preschoolers who were then randomly assigned to receive the special preschool training program for these parents uh, or did not receive any intervention. And families, as I've said, were randomly assigned to these treatments. The authors went on to develop a hybrid 
parent training program based on the four widely available parent training programs uh, in the U.S. and the world. Those programs, of course, are programs like uh, the Triple P program for positive parent behavior, uh, also the parent-child interaction therapy of Sheila Eiberg. There is also the Incredible Years program uh, that was uh, developed at the University of Washington uh, and some others, the New Forest program, which is primarily uh, a British program. They took the best of all of those behavioral parent training programs and then put that together in a treatment package and delivered it to these families. And long story short, they found that there was significant improvement in all of the symptom areas of ADHD, inattention, hyperactivity, uh, in impulsivity. Uh, they also found that there was uh, some improvement uh, in the uh, peer interaction scores of these individuals as well. Uh, little if any improvement occurred, however, in symptoms of emotional dysregulation uh, and no change in prosocial behavior, all of this being measured by parent completed rating scales. So uh, a very good study showing that providing intervention to parents of preschoolers uh, was effective in helping to reduce symptoms and improve uh, parenting in these individuals. Now, uh, a couple of things I'd like to say about this. First of all, uh, the control group didn't receive any intervention. Uh, and usually in a more rigorous study, we would be comparing two different interventions or the active intervention to an attention control group, a group that comes in and gets information about ADHD, but isn't given the specific techniques that the active intervention group is being given for behavior management. That would have been a much better study because usually when you compare an active intervention that involves contact with families to no intervention, everything looks good for the active intervention. It looks like it produced a lot of very specific results when in fact what you're measuring is simply the effects of providing professional attention to families. A powerful effect, by the way, We've seen in earlier studies where if parents are provided with professional attention, particularly on an ongoing basis for eight weeks, as was done in this study, they often report improvements in their child's behavior and family functioning, even without training in specific behavior management approaches. So uh, a better study would be to have included some kind of attention or placebo control group controlling for that kind of professional attention. Uh, but a noteworthy study, because it took place in China, it involved development of a program specifically intended for a Chinese parent audience and taking the best of the methods of four available parent training programs. So uh, that said, I think it was a, a very, very good study. By the way, other studies show that with school-age children, behavioral parent training doesn't produce as much improvement in ADHD symptoms. After all, ADHD isn't due to bad parenting, so improving parenting shouldn't uh, get rid of it. Uh, what it does tend to improve more than anything else is parent-child conflict and oppositional defiant behavior, which is why we often tell parents that behavioral parent training really is intended more to improving family relationships, parent-child interactions, and oppositional defiant behavior, and a lot less is intended to influence ADHD specific symptoms in its own right. So just keep that in mind. Behavioral parent training doesn't usually result in dramatic improvements in ADHD symptoms. But that said, uh, it does result in some improvement and particularly in family interaction patterns. So uh, that's our research for the week. I hope you found this informative. Please join me next week for another research review. Maybe Moose will make another cameo appearance. Uh, but until then, thanks for joining me, everybody, and be well.